Hello, my name's Andy. Welcome to episode 39 of Keeping Water. In this episode, I've just one topic, 2021's third project, which, as the title, thumbnail, and my latest social media posts make obvious, is about adding some new fish to the pond. It's something I've been planning since last autumn, although also a decision I've not always been totally convinced about. If you like this video, and would like to see how the new additions work out over the coming weeks and months, how my other projects developed, or just have an interest in the pond and the fish in general, then please subscribe to the channel. Remember, if you click the subscribe button, your fish will learn to tail walk like dolphins, and will do so whenever you whistle. I sometimes get the impression that some of my viewers don't completely believe me when I share the secrets of subscribe button clicks. If that's you, Hang around until towards the end of the video, where just this once I'll show you proof. Right, let's get started. Last year, while making one of my early episodes, I answered some questions about stocking levels and why I chose the species I have in my pond. Working out stocking levels is a complicated and somewhat imprecise science. There's so many factors to consider, including volume of water, filtration, quantity of feeding, etc. And I'm not sure I could work out an exact figure. Maybe others could. My somewhat subjective conclusion, therefore, was that my stocking level was appropriate for the size of pond and the filtration I had. Although, if anything changed, I'd need to make some improvements. By changed, I mean one or more of the following. The fish getting bigger, which is almost inevitable. Me feeding them more, the fish spawning, or me getting more fish. Even without definite plans to get more fish, I felt I needed to improve the filtration and general water quality management, which would, all being well, also make getting additional fish more feasible. The improvements I've made, as you may have seen in previous episodes, was to add filter floss to the skimmer, get a pond vac and build an additional moving bed filter. The aim of all this was to improve both the mechanical and biological filtration. They all seem to have worked to some degree. Certainly subjectively, the water clarity looks better. I'm more on top of solid waste in the pond and as recent tests have confirmed, the ammonia and nitrite are being efficiently managed to near zero. And the nitrate is at low and safe level. All this brought me to a stage where I could make a decision about getting new fish, which is where things got more interesting, as I got to decide what species to buy. The options were basically as follows. More common or mirror carp, some koi or other native species. I'll talk about koi first. As I covered in one of my first videos, I like quite a lot of koi types, but the theme of the pond is a natural one with native fish, so they just wouldn't fit with that, so they were out. Next, more carp. I really considered this, partly because I really like carp and partly because some additional carp might increase the confidence of my current ones. I eventually rejected this only because I liked the idea of having a different species in the pond more. So I then had to decide which new species to get. There's actually quite a lot of native ones you can buy, including minnows, sticklebacks, perch, pike, chub, roach and many more. However, there was one species that best fitted the natural UK pond theme and was a fish that I'd often caught while fishing as a young child. For me, they are synonymous with summer, small lakes and go hand in hand, or is that fin in fin, with tench, carp and rudd and that species is Crucian carp. Crucians are a member of the carp family and are somewhat similar on first sight to common carp, but with some distinct differences. They don't have barbels. 
They have a higher dorsal fin and strong red colour to their pelvic and anal fins. When they are young, especially, they have a deep golden bronze colour, although this can fade as they get older and larger. They also differ from other carp by being more timid and cautious feeders, something I will talk about a bit more later, as it may be a problem in the future. Aside from their small size and timidity, they are actually really hardy and can survive in less than ideal conditions, particularly low oxygen levels. Their nervousness was one of the reasons I tried to add some plants to the floor of the pond in my recent project to provide some cover for them. That didn't work out, but I'll revisit it in the future. Anyway, these are those new fish in the pond, but they didn't arrive today or yesterday. So I'll rewind a bit and show what I've been doing with them over the last few weeks and explain a little bit about the decisions I've made when introducing them. I don't have a permanent quarantine setup, but I do have this nice temporary pool, which is a perfect size for the four or five inch crucians as well as having a zip net built in which will combat any jumping, or more likely any cat-related shenanigans. I also don't have spare filtration for the pond, but I do have a spare aquarium filter, to which I added a small amount of K1 from my multi-bay and some filter floss, which would then give it a small amount of both mechanical and biological filtration. However, the primary means I use to ensure water quality will be regular water changes, which I completed every third day. I initially filled the pond with water straight from the main pond, which, especially considering the positive water tests I've had over the last month, means there were no water quality issues to worry about. The day the fish arrived was obviously quite exciting, although it's somewhat of mixed feelings, as they're obviously going to be quite stressed after being in a bag, in a box, in a delivery van for the past 18 hours or so. Now, there's a few opinions of how best to introduce fish after unboxing them. The schools of thought are broadly, one, float the fish in the bags to allow the water temperature to equalize and then empty the fish and water into the pond or tank. Two, float the fish in the bag again, then open the bag, remove the fish straight away and place them in the pond or tank, but not any of the water they've traveled in. Three, again, float the bags, then open them and slowly over time, introduce small amounts of the destination water into the bags to prevent shocking the fish with sudden changes of water chemistry. I don't think it takes a lot of thought to realise number one is out, but choosing between two and three is slightly trickier. Following three and mixing water chemistry makes sense, as temperature isn't the only possible difference fish would have to tolerate. However, I have a number of issues with it. I'm not sure, unless you mix water incredibly slowly over a long period of time, that you're actually able to adequately acclimatise the fish to changes in water chemistry, such as pH. Although you could also argue that some acclimation is better than none. The other issue is that the fish have been in the bags on a tiny amount of water for 18 to 20 hours, during which they've been producing ammonia, although this remains comparatively non-toxic within the closed system of a sealed bag. However, once you open the bag and introduce fresh air, the toxicity of the ammonia quickly increases and becomes harmful. Which makes option number two my preferred choice. Additionally, the fish were extremely stressed. Two were lying on their side and I wanted to get them out of the bags as quickly as possible. Therefore, once I'd left them for about 25 minutes to balance temperature, I opened the bags, removed the fish straight away and placed them in the pond.
The fish arrived looking a little beat up, some missing scales, abrasions and little tears in their fins. As I said earlier, they were quite stressed, with two lying on their side, which continued for a while when in the temporary pond. I gave them some peace and quiet for a bit, then checked on them intermittently. They appeared a little better, but still tired. They stuck quite firmly to one spot in the pond, grouped together, looking pretty nervous and stressed. Over the next few weeks, I checked on them regularly. They had a few patches of white in them, so I got one out to see exactly what these were and found them to be the patches of damaged skin or scratches they'd had when they arrived. The fish continue to appear quite stressed in the temporary pond. My garage isn't the best place to have a quiet and peaceful environment in which to keep fish. And I decided, based on no signs of infection, to cut short quarantine by a week and move them into the main pond a little early. Moving the fish into the pond was relatively simple. Although my filming of it wasn't too successful, I may need to get a cameraman. Anyway, as the water in the temporary pond was the same water as in my main pond, I just needed to ensure the temperature matched and I was good to go. Fortunately, my garage isn't heated, and as long as the sun hadn't heated the main pond up, the two were the same temp, and I could move the fish straight over. I therefore moved them over in the morning before the sun had got to work. I half filled a bucket with water and then netted the fish and placed them in it. Then it was just a matter of reversing this into the main pond. I took them out by hand at that end as I think it can actually be safer than using a net, especially for small fish, as they can't flap about and injure themselves. It also gave me an opportunity to have one last check of each fish. Just as a note, I made sure my hands were nice and cold from the pond water before handling them. The fish did what I kind of expected and swam straight down to the deepest part they could find, although surprised me a little by heading straight for the other fish, even the, to them, massive carp, and sought security by lying next to them. So, the fish are in and looking okay, it's still a little beat up and not quite settled in. They obviously look tiny compared to the carp and tench, and as you'll see they swim with the rudd a fair bit, but do struggle to keep up with them at times. At least one has had a look for food, something they didn't do at all in the temporary pond, and I think had a nibble at some algae. If they enjoy that, then they'll find an almost endless supply in my pond. They've also chosen to lie by the pipework, which is not only a good hiding spot, but also a way of keeping out of the flow in the pond. The next few weeks and months will be interesting. Obviously, with additional fish in the pond, I'm going to have to keep an eye on water quality but there are a number of other issues I need to keep an eye on. Firstly, that their bumps and bruises heal up. Hopefully, with the water warming up over the next few weeks, we'll see a reasonably quick result, with hopefully no infections along the way. Their colours will hopefully also become richer as they become less stressed and healthier. Secondly, I've already seen them get knocked around a bit accidentally by the carp. The tents are bigger and seem unbothered by this, and the rudd are quicker and can avoid it. Hopefully this won't cause any injuries or nervousness for the Crucians. Finally, that they get enough food. Early signs are good, but this could be a problem as firstly, Crucians are quite timid feeders 
and my carp and tench are, well, not, and are likely to bully them out of food. And secondly, I'll need to find the right food for them. They're quite small, so I need to find some small, about 2mm sinking pellets, as I doubt very much they'll ever surface feed. I could be wrong, but tench do after all. I've some vague plans to feed large pellets in one place, and then feed the small ones to wherever the crucians are settled away in, away from the larger fish. But we'll see if that's even possible, let alone successful. If it becomes an issue, and obviously after I've tried a lot of different approaches, it may be that they just won't get on in my pond, and I'd need to rehome them. One thing I will say though, is I had a single crucian in a cold water community tank a few years ago, admittedly with fish of a more similar size, and it did just fine feeding, so I may be worried unnecessarily. Having said all that, I think, once they grow, get more confident, and develop their rich colours, they're going to be a great addition to the pond. Please let me know what you think, especially if you've kept crucians yourself. I'd love to hear any tips and suggestions. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Keeping Water. I really do appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Hold on, I promised you something, and I'm nothing if not a man of my word. Proof of the magic of subscribing to the channel and the on-command stunts your fish will do. So, here goes. As I said, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. In next week's, I'll give you an update on how the Crucians are doing and take a look at quite a few repairs and tinkering I've had to get done around the pond over the last couple of weeks. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time. <laughs>